one series. It's the smallest of sample sizes, and it came against a team that's probably going to drop 100 games this season. But the Braves' opening weekend series against the Nationals underscored one thing. This team is going to be very, very good. Welcome into BPTV. Corey McCartney and Grant McCauley with you as always. And Grant, outside of a rocky debut from top prospect Jared Schuster, there was a lot to like about what unfolded in Nationals Park. Yeah, I think there was an awful lot to like as far as what we saw incrementally by this club or I guess in the different categories and different position groups of this team. The one thing I think that is the, the I guess, the red flag, if you will, is how long are you going to be without Max Freed? That was not part of the opening series or opening day script that the Braves have written up. Hopefully it's not going to be very long. It doesn't sound like it is. I know we're going to get into all of that as we continue on here on the show. But yeah, I mean, if you keep winning series all year long, as we've said time and again, season after season, and as it goes all the way back to the Bobby Cox days, you're going to be in a pretty good spot. Yeah, it seems the formula is for success, no doubt. So three games being what it is, we can always run the risk of hyperbole here. But let's get into some things that really did look undeniable. On the offensive side, we know this lineup is going to be a juggernaut. It was largely held in check by the Nationals' Mackenzie Gore in the series finale. But a combined 15 runs in three games, seven extra base hits, including four home runs in Saturday's win. I think we saw two things in particular here that really set the stage for season-long storylines for me. Because a year after coming in with some ridiculous pressure, Matt Olson is primed for a monster season, and the limits on pickoffs are going to make Ronald Acuna Jr. a pretty clear bet to challenge for a 40-40 season. Yeah, I think both of those things are true, and we're going to see how that all plays out over the course of the season with those changes. It might not just be Ronald Acuna Jr. running a little bit more. We'll see if some of the other Braves get in on the action. Michael Harris is kind of hitting in the middle of the order. By the way, so is Ozzie Albies, so I don't know if they're going to steal quite as many bases in that spot typically or traditionally that's not the case. But maybe with these rules changes, you throw some of the traditional thoughts right out the door. But yeah, Matt Olson, with the spring, you just had this feeling. I, I know that spring numbers are not what you want to make a big case for somebody having a huge year, but it's not bad to have the kind of spring that he had and bring that kind of momentum north. And not only that, but the changes that he made to his stance and, and to his overall, I think, weight distribution late in the 2022 season. Alex Anthopoulos said that's what really started to unlock things for Olson. Then he went to work a little bit more of the winter came in in the spring and looks as good as he's ever looked uh, in, in terms of what we have seen in the 2023 between exhibition and the first series against the Nationals. Yeah, he's going to strike out a little bit. That's part of baseball these days, but it looks like he's going to hit a bunch of home runs and pick up a lot of extra base hits, and that is exactly what the Braves acquired Matt Olson to do. Yeah, I mean, a 1,500 OPS in the spring, obviously, that was the best of his career. But to me, it was the eight homers and 47 Grapefruit League at bats. Uh, he doubles in the opener, then hits two homers on Saturday, the first of which had an exit velocity of 110 miles an hour. It took him 69 games last season to get his first multi-homer game. He's just locked in. I mean, after 34 homers a year ago, 39 in 2021, uh, this was a nice tone-setting weekend for him. And on Acuna, his first stolen base of the season – which was after two pickoff attempts, comes with a secondary lead of 21.7 feet. So to put that into context and further illustrate how much of a game changer this new rule is, in 2021, when Acuna was completely healthy, he was averaging 15.8 feet on his secondary lead. In 2019, when he looked like he was threatening for 40-40, he averaged 16.7. So that 20-foot uh, secondary lead may not be the norm, but I think it's going to likely elevate uh, across the year. When we look back, I think it's going to be much higher. Uh -huh. And I think Acuna is poised to really take advantage of this rule change. And isn't it just incredible the amount of things that we track in the game today? That's just not something that fans had access to 20, 30 yeah. years ago. I mean, I don't know if we had access to that 10 years ago. But be that as it may, I think it's very exciting for a number of different reasons. And it illustrates exactly what you just said, that these rules are going to have an effect. Now, you may not take a 21 or 22 foot lead every time. And pitchers can disengage that third time and throw over. If they pick you off, you are out. If they yeah. don't, it's a balk. And that's the obviously the line that a lot of pitchers are probably not going to be willing to walk. But we'll see how aggressive Ronald Lacuna gets with that secondary lead. Because you know, if you got that kind of lead and then get a good jump, don't fall down like he did the first time. He's kind of spinning his wheels there. He's going to be, I think, just fine at second base, no matter who's behind and the plate, all respect to JT Romuto, among others. I think Ronald Lacuna Jr. could challenge for 50 stolen bases this year. And you might have noticed on Twitter, I have a 40-40 tracker going. He took care of the stolen base on opening day. 
hit a leadoff home run in the second game of the season. So he's on a pretty good pace for both of those to eclipse 40-40, but we're through just three games. So we might just save on pace for a little bit later this season. Yeah, he's going to keep you awfully busy, though, on that track yeah, for is. sure. So <laughs> opening opening day did take an unfortunate turn for Max Freed. You mentioned earlier exits after 43 pitches with left ham, uh, hamstring discomfort. Uh, may only miss one start uh, because of the mandatory 15 days in the IL. Uh, it could be backdated, but the rotation does get a little bit murkier there. Obviously, Kyle Wright and Michael Soroka had their spring injuries. Ian Anderson is an option to get called up, but he got roughed up on Sunday. Three homers in the first nine batters that he faced. But say this, as the Braves come out of their first series, the bullpen's rested. And man, Spencer Strider absolutely looked dominant uh, coming off of his Rookie of the Year runner-up finish. Yeah, Spencer Strider just picked up right where he left off in 2022. I know that that postseason start was not the final note that he wanted to have on that season. He came off of a layoff dealing with that oblique issue. Was not himself quite clearly in that start. After the first couple of innings, he lost a lot of velocity. But look, let's put that in the past and concentrate on 2023. And if Spencer Strider is writing a first chapter or getting that first impression, if you will, out of the way, it was an awfully good one in the second game of the season. Yeah, and losing Max Free, that clearly could have been something that blew up the bullpen. And then you have a starter making his major league debut that looked like for a moment he might not get out of the first inning. Then you compound it with Freed's injury. It looked like it could have been kind of critical mass for the Braves pitching staff in just three games. They do have the depth. You mentioned some of those names. If Freed goes on the injured list, which is the expectation, according to Brian Snitker, they just haven't done it yet, procedurally speaking. Then I think it's Bryce Elder that's going to get the call to jump into rotation for him at least once in that Cardinal series because Freed was slated to go in the third game there. Yep. Then I guess you figure it out going forward. But as you said, you can backdate it uh, You know, uh, to the day after he pitched. I'm not sure if all that math is going to check out in time for, say, Kyle Wright to get back in and help you out a little bit in rotation. I believe he's eligible to come off the injured list on April 11th. It's just going to be one of those things that the Braves are going to have to monitor a little bit. And now, instead of just worrying about, hey, who's the fifth starter for this club, they got to kind of figure out, okay, who's the fifth starter? Who's filling in for Kyle Wright? And now who's filling in for Max Freed? That was not what the Braves had in mind when they started the season. It is April. It is early. And as you and I talked about an awful lot, I think the offense is capable of carrying this club and helping out this pitching staff as they try to plug some of these holes and get healthy as the month of April moves on. On Strider, he had nine strikeouts over six scoreless innings, averaging 97.5 mile per hour on the four scene, got a 40% whiff rate on the slider. And that changeup, he threw six of them, had three whiffs on four swings. I know this is a horrendous Nationals lineup, but man, he looked he looked absolutely fantastic. So next up for the Braves, a trip to St. Louis uh, where they'll go against uh, with Charlie Morton on Monday against Jake Woodford, Dylan Dodd in his MLB debut on Tuesday versus Steven Matz in Atlanta. We'll have to fill free spot on Wednesday as the Cardinals start Miles Michaelis. It's always exciting to see an MLB, uh, MLB debut like Dodd will have on Tuesday. But Grant, I'm really focused on Morton here because obviously he's coming off that season in which he allowed more homers than any of his 15 big league campaigns. And he had the second highest walk rate of his career a year ago. Yeah, he did. The home runs, I think, were probably the most troubling. I mean, Charlie's always hit some batters. The walks were a little bit elevated as well, and you know, never want to give up free base runners. And it felt like he would be going along well until he wasn't, or he would get ambushed early, and then he'd settle in. It just felt like he was always trying to avoid the big inning, and it usually involved a hit batsman or a walk or two, and then a very untimely home run or two that cropped up last year. And I'm hoping that he's able to make some adjustments because he's still got the swing and miss stuff. 205 strikeouts last year in 170 or so innings. That's something that you'll take out of your fourth starter any day. But I think you and I both know, and Braves fans should know, Charlie Morton is not the average fifth starter. I know there were some questions about giving him the $20 million. The Braves essentially picked up his option and tacked on another one. And I feel like that was a move that they wanted to make if Charlie was open to it. And I feel like the 2022 version of Morton is not necessarily what we should expect to see again in 2023 if you just look at his track record. But all of a sudden, Corey, he does become kind of a focal point of this rotation when you have your ace in Max Freed, your 20-game winner in Kyle Wright, unavailable to you for at least a couple of weeks between the two of them. Charlie Morton is the kind of leader that the Braves need on the staff, particularly when you have two or three young pitchers that are going to have to kind of cut their teeth in the case of a couple of them and maybe just step back in and try to recapture some of the magic in the case of, say, a Bryce Elder if he jumps into rotation to pick up for Max Freed being lost for at least a start. But you do have Spencer Strider. That's another big one. A lot of clubs would like to say, hey, we've got Spencer Strider as well. But the Braves pitching depth has been tested immediately. And I think it would be a big time shot in the arm for Charlie Morton to go out there and have a vintage performance. 
Yeah, he's facing a Cardinals lineup that's, uh, you know, never really had a lot of success against them. They're hitting a collective 173 with a 552 OPS, but Nolan Arenado does have a near 880 OPS against him, and he has taken him deep before. Uh, by the way, some news came out just before we started uh, recording this episode of BPTV. The Braves will retire Andrew Jones, number 25, on September 9th. Grant, I know this is a, a, something that a lot of people have been waiting for, and I, I know you, as you tweeted, uh, it's about time. Yeah, no, it most certainly is. And I think with Andrew Jones making a, a very, very good case for the Hall of Fame, we're going to continue to see how that plays out. There was no question that he is a Braves Hall of Famer already. I mean, that is the fact that he already has been. Yep. And if he is in the Braves Hall of Fame and puts up those kind of numbers and is being considered for Cooperstown like this, maybe it's time to retire that number. So the Braves haven't quite reached the point that the Yankees had where they're going to have to stop issuing numbers, perhaps, to their coaches. But I think taking number 25 out of service and hanging it up there alongside many of his contemporaries, including the big three, including Chipper Jones, and we'll see who, who goes down in the future, and some of the all-time greats, the Aarons, the Matthews, the Spawns, and the likes, and Dale Murphy, that's a place where I think Andrew Jones 25 should hang because he had a decade of dominance, particularly defensively, and was involved in one of the greatest eras of Braves baseball we've ever seen. A very, very good honor for a very, very great center fielder, perhaps the greatest defensive center fielder we're ever going to see. Yeah, I mean, obviously about time. We don't have to get into the whole Cooper down, Cooperstown credentials here. I, I think everyone knows how we both feel. Yeah. Um, that's something that's also uh, well-deserved, and, and it's about time that one happens as well. By the way, we're getting a little closer to a milestone for the Braves as they continue this road trip ahead of Thursday's home opener against the Padres. Austin Riley is three homers from 100. He's got a chance to become the third player since the franchise moved to Atlanta in 1966 to get to 100 by his 500th career game. Would you like to take a stab at the other two players? All right, I'm going to take a stab at this because I believe, based on my old-time Braves fandom, that Bob Horner is one of these guys since he never played in the minor leagues. And I'm thinking that there's probably a contemporary. Why don't you help me out with the other one? All right, well. I came to represent the other one today. So Ronald Acuna Jr. had 118 before his 100th game, uh, 500th game. So Austin Riley has an opportunity to join the two of them. By the way, we've got you covered all season long here on BP TV. So make sure that you subscribe, turn on notifications, and tell a friend as we look to keep this thing growing. Until next time, I'm Corey McCartney. He's Grant McCauley, and we'll see you soon, Braves country.